All right. Uh, there's there's not a whole lot going on with PRs right now. We've got two new ones. Uh, Radic and Adam are working on this two-phase commit encoding stuff, which I'm super excited about. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really hoping that that's actually going to help improve things a lot, since we won't be doing as much like creating small buffer pointer yeah things yeah, and aim together and stuff. That'll hopefully help some. I think the main thing is that it it eliminates the bounds checks that happen with every single integer field that you're including. I think that's the main bit when actually not the Oh really? Buffer. Yes. And especially it's um uh painful uh sorry for not turning a video video. I've got a code uh, a code. Uh the problem uh the problem is uh, even more visible uh, when it comes to uh, to clients where we link libcommon dynamically. For the sake of LD underscore preload, uh, we have a lot of jumping even in in uh, in buffer lists. So, right. Well, I I'm saw I saw the pattern uh, for even for. Uh, even for encoding a, a stupid uh, 32 bits integer, we need to go uh, through, uh, we need to jump over crazy number of locations. Well, the, the same yeah. applies uh, even to uh, to uh, our our constructors of buffer list. Let me provide a link to PR. Radic, do you see bounce checking as being like the major like win there? I'm I'm curious just because I don't I didn't see that as actually showing up on only, the profile. Only not so. only the problem is right there in the in the relationship between the the instructions we need to uh, to take only for uh, the housekeeping activities. Bound checks are one of them, but definitely not the sole one. Okay. That's yeah. That's really interesting. Sage, what what makes you think, or what are, what are you, how how are you kind of arriving to the conclusion that you think balance checking is kind of the big win? Oh, I was just assuming that that's where the cost for append was. I wasn't thinking about the the fact that it has to do a a jump um, because of the dynamic linking or whatever. That also makes sense. Okay. So, and either way, I, I, if I'm understanding Radic, that the real win is if um, as a result the the encode gets fully inlined. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yep. Uh, okay. That's that append. Well, there are a couple of uh, approaches. Uh, the first, the most ambitious one, is to have uh, buffer list appends uh, inlineable, and uh, also with the dead code elimination from compiler. That will be the greatest. Uh, that's the holy grail. Uh, second idea uh, is Adam work on. Uh, two-phase uh, encoding uh, encoding stuff. Well, this uh, doesn't help uh, append, but the most prominent user of uh, small appends, I guess. Uh, the third uh, idea uh, to, uh, is uh, to introduce some kind of continuous reserver to glue uh, small, really small appends, like integer encoding, uh, to bigger things. That's the uh, the first one is the the thing uh, we were talking about uh, the core stand up. Radic, when you said the Adam's work on the two phase encoding doesn't help appends, you you mean that it's um it doesn't directly help appends, but it kind of indirectly does, right? Well, actually, it eliminates uh, yeah, exactly appends. Uh, Adam is uh, Adam is using the introduced uh, append hole. Uh, to fill it light, because up and hole returns you something like uh, continuous filler. It's a very thin, extremely thin abstraction over C pointer. So it's really good uh, to use mem copy on. The way uh, we are optimizing uh, the overhead of just the preamble uh, of encoding. The, third, the three fields we have, uh, struct V, compact V plus size. Cool. Okay. I'm super excited about this stuff. I think it's going to be good. 
Yeah. So there was another, um, uh, let's see, where is there? There was another pull request you had open um, that I noticed. Um, well, okay, Keep is gonna send an email about the ABI changes because that's sort of blocking a bunch of this stuff. And then we need to get an answer there. Um, there's also, so he's gonna open up a thread and we'll see what, just so we can discuss on the list. The other one was, though was, um, there, I saw one that, okay, dropping git contiguous and buffer list, that's just a cleanup because it's not actually helping or hurting. Yes, it's just cleanup. We have one user, sorry, I guess. And it and doesn't uh, rely on the, uh, yeah. And the um, dropping the unused request redirect T OST instructions. Did you notice that because it was the creation and decoding of that buffer list it's that was never used? Or did you just notice that it was never used? Uh, let me uh, let me take a look on the PR. Uh, ST... I just, I'm just curious if it was ah, okay. that brought that up. Uh, uh, and I need to recall, sorry. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Uh, I wasn't, I haven't find, found that uh, by profiling. Uh, I'm just running some, uh, I just, I just, inst I'm instructing compiler uh, to testify about some users of methods uh, I'm interested in in buffer list, and that was uh, one of the things similar to the uh, to the uh, KV one. So basically, I have no idea whether it uh, whether it actually helps the perf. Uh, it was found at compile time. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just skimming your other pull requests and see what else is here. Uh, killing the last P member. Okay, this is this is the, other, the other one I had a question about. You have all these check marks. Is this because you're going through and auditing all these callers to make sure that they don't? Yep. Uh, I instructed I in C to print a deprecation warning when some when any guy uh, uses uh, the function at and it GCC does it at compile time. So I have a list of all users, uh, well, around for uh, around forties, not so much. And I'm doing manual inspection to see whether they are actually making use, true use of of the uh, functionality. Most of them aren't. Most of the users just uh, pass zero as the offset uh, to, to, for instance, to be in. So they definitely don't uh, uh, don't use uh, the, the optimization. Okay. Actually, yeah, they I like are. I I encounter it maybe uh, maybe five or seven or seven places where we really need to uh, where we where the last P can be significant. I don't know whether it really is, whether it can be. But switching uh, to explicit uh, hint passing is, is an option, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the idea of getting Barperless into a single cache line sounds pretty nice. Well, yep, and we can minimize uh, the buffer list even more. I have patches uh, killing up and buffer. Well, I construct the the pull requests are are pretty small actually. Uh, the thing uh, I spend most time on is the uh, is the big branch with uh, hyper, hyper combined buffers. It has uh, both uh, uh, last p and up and buffer eliminated. Plus, uh, we switched to std. Uh, sorry, we switched from std list to uh, boost intrusive uh, counterpart. Actually, there, after rewriting, rewriting after touching two places, we could switch from uh, double linked list to uh, single linked list. But well, I guess it would be mostly for for. I wouldn't expect uh, huge performance benefits only because yeah. of that. 
But inclusive I list. I think it's nice to be able to go. I think it's nice to have a double link that we're going to do it, but I like I like the idea of, of, of intrusive very much. Uh, yep, yeah, it all it it allows to uh, to manage our memory on ourselves, which means that the uh, which allows to allocate uh, both data uh, encapsulating buffer row plus encapsulating uh, buffer yep. pointer plus even hooks uh, for uh, buffer pointer. Uh, in one in one go, in one huge piece of memory. So with intrusive lists, how do you do the sharing of pointers between different buffer lists then? I created hangable uh, buffer uh, buffer pointer, and oh. uh, it has uh, assignments killed. So if a buffer pointer gets a connection with buffer row, it's uh, it's a lifetime connection actually, and if somebody if there is another uh, buffer pointer pointer liking to uh, reference the same buffer row, then it's 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 allocated separately just just like uh, like. Uh, That's brilliant. I like it. Well, uh, I haven't tested that actually. Oh. <laughs> I just... Someone's going to want that, but I uh, no, no. But we, we we tried to do this a long time ago. We didn't get this. We didn't get this. We didn't get this bit. This is really good. We'll see. No performance testing yet. Just it passes uh, buffer list unit test. Nothing more than I I I I haven't checked nothing more actually. Promising. But no. I'm hoping it can help with uh, the holy grail of of app of uh, app and optimization. I mean. Uh, allowing a compiler to do uh, to uh, dead code elimination. Basically, our appends uh, are consistent of two phases. One is uh, just verification whether we have enough space. If so, let's go fill. Uh, let's let's go do mem copy. But the second stage is uh, allocation, and if we could inline even the first part and uh, use our knowledge about the sizes we have at compile time uh, then maybe compiler will be able to emit nothing more than just mem copy plus uh, updating uh, two counters one is the underscore len in buffer list and one is uh, underscore len in buffer pointer I tried that without uh, last week. I tried that without uh, the uh, without uh, the hyper combined stuff, and I ran into very se very severe problems with uh, the restrict sorry underscore underscore restrict uh, in GCC and C plus <laughs> plus, and I was yeah. able to only kill uh, alia to I was uh, I was able. To only hint compiler, there is no aliasing uh, in, with buffer list between buffer list and uh, buffer pointer and buffer list and buffer row. But I wasn't able to guarantee there is no aliasing between uh, between buffer pointer and buffer row. So compiler didn't make uh, well. It was able to kill uh, the checks for whether we need to go for the second stage. But didn't uh, didn't uh, turn it uh, didn't merge land updates. So we had uh, a sequence of move. I mean, small mem plus updating counters. Another uh, move, updating counters. Another move, uh, updating counters. Not so safe. But with hyper combined, maybe well. We will we will have uh, one huge object. So maybe compa so maybe this will be enough uh, to 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 hint compiler appropriately because we not, at the moment we are able to to provide compiler with hint for buffer list nothing more. But we, if we have uh, two only two objects uh, in the equation, maybe this will be enough. We'll see. Anyway, the, the restrict support in GCC is is. Confusing, at least. Okay. Um, 
Now that, now that we've spent the first 20 minutes talking about uh, our <laughs> one PR, should we should we move on? Yeah. What what else is there? Matt, do you do you you? It looks like you reviewed this uh, distributed data cache PR for Rados GW. Is there anything interesting going on there? Uh, well, not with respect, not not not, not with not, not 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 in the areas that this call normally covers, but we're but 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 in terms of the um, topology, you know, topology for um, for 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 our GWs with it with a, with with, with um, some type of uh, associative cache. Structure uh, was, was was something that the <coughs> folks at folks at uh, Boston University and collaborators are have worked on last year and got and got some cool performance numbers with. It's it's it's, it's, it's this is a topology this is this is a set sort of topologies for for Rails Gateway where where where, where you where you either have perhaps you have, you know, in one in one variation perhaps you have a, a very a, a slower storage tier and it's sort of doing it's sort of doing something like cache tiering but very but but at the RW level but but past that it it can. It, 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 it can do it, 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 it can just provide a much hotter environment for um, for you know, for for, uh, for transactional workloads uh, stuff like Hadoop uh, Hadoop, Hadoop you know, it, might, it, might, it might have and if, this this is mostly about the about actual valid consistent data sets but there's also the ephemeral data sets in Hadoop and other kinds of things are going on here prefetching uh, is being worked on by the students. Um, so it's like uh, with perfect knowledge, uh, using you know, using prefetch, prefetch hints that come from the S3A you know, from Hadoop. We're going to feed that to the S3A interface, stuff like that. So it's probably not probably <laughs> pretty interesting for that purpose, but but we're going to try to merge this on the next next few weeks. And and if you and if you're interested in in in, in, in evaluating uh, tiered RGWs uh, for our workload performance, uh, it could be interesting to you. In terms of what are what are the things that you guys are trying to, or like not you guys, I guess, but what what is it that was kind of the primary use case for this? Uh, one 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 is when you're trying when you, well a primary use case a primary use case is when you're when you're, when you're doing when you're doing uh, Hadoop Spark uh, and Linux workloads on 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 um, in a, in a, you know in a, in a, in a multi tenant environment uh, with a, with a large and dispersed. Um, Universe of of large data sets as 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 primary input. <laughs> All right, it'll cache. You'll have like a host local or rack local cache that we're passing through. Exactly. So the RGW will locally cache parts of the data set, but it maintains consistency because it's still fetching the head from the the backend cluster, and then it's only the tail of the RGW object that's cached locally. So you get the same consistency model. Um, so you can sort of easily cache that data closer. No. It's nice because it doesn't complicate the, yeah, doesn't mess up the consistency. That, so. that seems to be kind of the, the theme, right, is is if we can avoid this trade-off of destroying our consistency to get good performance. Yeah. If we can yeah. do something like this. I mean, there's a, I mean, the possibility of trading off consistency for 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 data sets that don't need consistency is another thing, thing they can do. Uh, there is, some, as I say, there is some Hadoop Spark. There, are, there, there, there is, there's, there, there are, there are models you know, or for, there are computations in in that universe that or in that in that world of you know, in that set of, I don't know what's called that in, in that in that family of workloads too. But but for the for, for the most part, we're interested in the, this this is about keeping the about the consistent ones that require consistency. But you're, but but you're basically you're building the analytics as a tier, uh, and the storage can be all over the place. Should we should we jump to the topics here? I'm not. We already talked about the T phase commit. Um, I'm not sure there's anything to talk about with the Nick Fisk up one until we actually run tests to try to reproduce it. Um, but the yeah. NEMA awareness thing did come up. I would like to talk about that one. If we can. Okay. Sure. Um, and the, the meta question here was just that I've heard people say that if they pin um, the OSD to a particular NUMA node, performance is better over the years. I don't remember who. Well, I know I know Kyle's played with this. Um, I think the the high level question is what is the best practice as as far as NUMA pinning goes, 
and is this something we can happen make happen automatically or is there something that we can do so that people don't have to go messing around under the covers to try to from from a higher level perspective i guess maybe my question would be why does it appear that the Linux scheduler is moving the OSC processes across NUMA nodes. Why is it that yeah. we have to pin stuff to make it perform good if that's actually the case? Because that's crazy, yeah. right? Well, that's a good question, but <laughs> in, in, in practice. <laughs> well, but, but there's, there's valid. We've there's seen valid it a lot. We saw it, we saw it yes. in Melanox. We saw it with Melanox cards and, and other things that, you know, you, but yeah. it, it wasn't the Linux kernel wasn't always prioritizing putting the process or the thread on 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 the on the, on the node associated with the card. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the problem. You have you have two NUMA nodes. Some of the NVMEs are in one of them. Some of the NVMEs are the other. And so you want the OC to be running on the right NUMA node. And the kernel, I think, isn't smart enough to know that. Oh, I'm mostly doing I/O with this device. Or maybe you're, you're in a this broken situation where your NIC is on one NUMA node and your NVME is on the other NUMA node, and so you're like stuck. If you, has a lot to do if with you lay it all out, if if you lay it all out perfectly, right? If you think about it and you design your hardware so that you've got everything nicely contained into nodes and everything is beautiful, you can make it really, really good, right? But if you just kind of blindly say, okay, I'm going to pin OSDs one through four on this four, and you know, kind of you know, lay it out, there's no guarantees that you're going to exactly, and that's what I want right. to be very mindful of. So I wonder exactly. if um, if this is something that we should do in, in the crush map. <clears throat> Maybe that underneath the host level of the hierarchy, we could have a NUMA node level. And so the um, the OSD could be smart enough to like map itself under the right NUMA node in a, on a NUMA machine. Because um, if that were the case, then somebody can go in and create a like a config mule rule somehow that maps I can big option pinning you to a particular NUMA node based on what, where you are in the hierarchy or some other metadata. So if your like think... if your net if your network is on one NUMA node and your disk is on another NUMA node, what's the right NUMA node? Right, there probably isn't one. So then whoever's designing the system can't do that. But I think that that what we want to avoid is a situation where you have to go manually, like assuming you understand your hardware architecture, you have to say this OSD is on this NUMA node, this one's on that one, like if there's a way that we can streamline and automate that so it's like a less painful process so that, you know, I know I'm we, using this particular machine. Um, I know that NUMA node, um, that the first four NVMEs are always mapped to <laughs> just NIC or something like that. Like if there's a way that we can actually make that easier, then that would be good. There, we, we can't put that in the crush map. I mean, if someone accidentally swaps two drives around, then they're gonna migrate all their data. Um, well, what we could probably do is like look for NUMA nodes and then like pin it when we start up a process, right? Because that's the only time you actually care is when the process starts. A, yeah. Right. There's a system CTL thing that you can like say what what cores you want the process to be restricted to. So you can yeah. you could you can set that. I think the big question is still though. I mean, it's a, a heuristic a big nasty right. one as to what goes where and i if if we're solving this i i really question whether or not we should be solving this or if this is something that needs to be solved at like the the kernel level because this is so this i mean we can bigger problem than us that the kernel it's, doesn't know what network we're going to use and what device we're going to use though right so i, I think it yeah. can't happen there it's either going to be us uh, or it's going to be like ansible yeah, or something or, or, and, or, yeah. but, that scares me. <laughs> and it, it, well, it's, it seems like we could do the very most simple one where the network and the drive are on the same exactly. node. Exactly. And that's probably all we need because otherwise it is or, too hard and probably the person knows what they're doing anyway at that point. And and it might even be that um, there are like the way that they, if they configure the like public network or whatever, it might be that they have two cards, one on each NUMA node, and we could be smart enough to pick an IP on the right card that happens to be on our same NUMA node. Right now, we're just picking the first one that we find that matches the public network parameter or whatever it is. Um, so I think there should, could be something. I think what we need is um, somebody who under, has a machine that um, actually looks like this and mm -hmm. understands what it should look like, and they can help us figure out what the heuristics are. 
because presumably I have to go poke around the SysFS to figure out what node we're on and all that. I have no idea how that works. I, I will say I, I used to maintain a, a big SGI NUMA system in the HPC world, and all of this is really, really nasty. Like, it's, it, it was horrible. The, 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 especially storage on the system was really, really slow. We spent a lot of time trying to make all this kind of stuff work. It's not going to be a fast, easy, like, yeah. win, I don't yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. I just, just, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe it will all work beautifully. Maybe we'll make it really, really good and perfect and nice. But I'm, I'm worried. Black well, well I mean, it, you're going to have to face it in some degree. I mean, but I know this much. When, when, when we were working on Excelio, and Mellanox got the good numbers that they, you know, they, 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 they were the reported good numbers all came from environments that had been matched. You know, yeah. so the interrupts and things were being hard. We, we, we were adapting, being, you know, handled by the by the by the by the by the by the, by the Nick. Is it, you know, we, we, we try to make stuff really good and run well on everything, right? But I, I still wonder, are we better off just kind of telling people avoid all of this? You know, try to try to build simple, small nodes and scale out your nodes and make your network good rather than than trying to, like, tune for, like, really yeah, complex I mean, I think systems. I think it's kind of inevitable. I mean... When we say NUMA system, we're just talking about a dual socket system, right? Well, maybe dual socket, but like AMD in the past has had quad socket systems that don't have like actually, um, right. you know, full full bandwidth between all sockets. You have but like I, I complicated guess, topology. I guess my my point is that um, these systems are so common and they're hard to avoid because you have a one U box. You're gonna have a one U box that has you know like 24 of these new like 12 terabyte ruler stick SSDs and being using it, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to drive those with a single socket. You're going to need two sockets at least, and you're probably going to want more. So, and you, the, it's hard to scale down the host from that because then you'd have to have sleds or you'd have to have a single one U box with two distinct hosts in it. And like people just aren't building those. So I, I think it's, I think it's hard to avoid this. Um, but at, at the same time, it seems like the situation, like if we can solve the like, most handling most cases out of the box. For example, just having a heuristic that says, if the if I'm using a single storage device and a single NIC, and I can find a new node where they're both on the same node, then I'll pin myself to that node. Like that's an easy heuristic and it'll probably work most of the time. Um, and people with weird systems will still have to go do something yeah. else. Um, but at least we can sort of do the right thing most of the time um, and have a baseline so that if there's a, smarter heuristic that somebody can iterate on, then they can do that later. This is as much a hardware problem as it is a software problem, though, right? I mean, if if you're talking about such high-performance nodes, which we can't even really, you know, let's be realistic, right? Until we have C-Store and C-Star, yeah. this, this is kind of, uh, you know, maybe helping a little. Uh, maybe it helps yeah. more than I think it does. I don't know, but it... I think it, it it helps a lot. It's it's not getting us all the way <laughs> by any means. Well, <laughs> so long yeah, it, it, it's a it's yeah. kind of a crutch, right? Um, yeah. But anyway, I, it, yeah. sure do that. Um, but that still places the burden on the system administrator or, or the designer, I guess, the architect that's yeah. designing these systems right. to actually like lay stuff out so that it you have yeah. stuff close by. Yeah. How about I send an email to the list about Numa pitting and just ask these questions and. Hopefully, the, our, our hardware friends, somebody who pays attention, can can chime in. We some vendors are certainly more open to this kind of thing than others, right? Like when back in the Ink Tank days, we had a lot of discussions like this with different hardware vendors, and some of them definitely seem to be more aware of these kinds of issues than others are. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be a kind of comprehensive discussion, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I know I've definitely looked at several hardware proposals where they're looking at a particular motherboard or whatever, and it's just like, it's just kind of fundamentally broken where you have like, they have eight NVMEs, four of them on each core, 
but the network is always on only one of them. And so <laughs> there's like no, <laughs> there's like no win because or, half of them are you, have it. Or, or heck, let's, you have like eight NVMe drives be, sitting behind um, some kind one of core. like PCIe one expander topic. that, you know, you know, you've got like four links and everything is sharing them. They're all on one socket. You've got on the other socket the network, and you've got like bottlenecks everywhere in the whole system, and it doesn't make any sense. Then, yeah, you know. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I can't can't really fix that. But yeah. Well, anyway. not, not a well, we can right sort of if we've got the ability to say that this is the the thing that Ceph should run on, and it's you know certified to do be fast, but we kind of try to target everything. Yeah. Um. Okay. Anything? Anything else, else that we should talk about? I don't think I have anything. The the only thing I was going to ask you, Sage, is you were, you were testing you tested the the issue that Nick ran into, and you thought that it looked like we were doing the right thing. Yeah, I just did a vstart cluster and I did rate us bench with 4K writes and I just looked at the log and verified that I had like 16 4K writes that were deferred and then after that all the deferred IOs were submitted at once and then 16 more that were deferred and then they're submitted at once. So I just confirmed that it was actually doing the batching that it's supposed to do. Um, that was just at the rate of bench dash B 4K. So that was on master. Is Maybe it's different on mimic. But I don't think this code has changed. So, I don't know. It wasn't how a performance you, test. I just looked at the log. You, yeah. I, whatever you did to look at the log, is that something Nick could do on his to ensure that you guys saw the same? Um, sure. Yeah, I just turned blue store, debug blue store 20 and then looked for deferred. Look for deferred. Oh. Okay. I'll oh, try and get that. Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can paste you what you'll have. You'll see a whole bunch of um, deferred queue lines. This for each I/O, and then after okay, a yeah. while, you'll see a um, deferred submit, deferred try submit thing that'll have a whole bunch of I/Os, and that should happen every like in transactions. I think that's what it is. Okay. Nick, there was a counter that you were looking at, which I have to admit I haven't looked at before, that, that wasn't being oh, yeah. incremented for yeah. deferred um, IOs in your test? Um, yeah, so it looks like there's two different ones. There's blue store right small deferred and blue store right small new. And with the right into a pre-populated RBD, the deferred one, the right small deferred was increasing. And with the Rados bench, it looked like the right small new was increasing instead. So I, I was just wondering if there's, it is doing some sort of deferring, but there, there's someone else with creating the object, which is still sort of holding so holding the process up. The other thing, the thing to keep in mind is that there are two ways that we decide to defer IOs. One is in do write small, and that's the one that's kicking the counter. The other place that triggers deferred rights is in the alloc write, um, and that one is not kicking the counter. Um, so I think that that's probably a, something we should, um, either to kick the same counter or to rename the counter at a different one. But that's that's probably why you saw that. Okay, right. Um, yeah, I'll do some. I mean, I'm definitely seeing a difference in terms of end performance, but I'll, I'll look yeah. for the logs as well to confirm, see if I'm seeing the same as what you're saying. And at the end of the day, so that the, the problem, I can't actually look at this because my dev box had a hard drive like dangling, <laughs> like cable strewn across the thing, and that disk has failed, um, and it's not connected, whatever. I, I don't have a machine that has a hard drive in it that I can, on my development environment, I'll have to go. Okay. To your stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a long sad story. I ordered a new rack that had more space, that had like acoustic isolation and whatever, 
and they delivered it. It's sitting in my garage. And then I realized that it's too big to fit in the door to get into the basement. Um, <laughs> and they won't take it back. So I have this like <laughs> full size rack in my garage. I don't know what to do with it. How big is like, it, Sage? Uh, it's 42U. So it's like. Oh, it's just a 42U rack? It's not a, it's not a full height. It's like a third height, I guess. But it's just too I'm wide. Dri I'm driving you to need one of those and today, later today. Oh, really? Yeah, if I you can use a rack in the basement. How <laughs> But the problem is it's too wide, so I'll tell you how wide it is, and you can make sure it'll fit in your basement first, and then if you want to rack. Okay. Yeah. You need to get one of those. Um, of <laughs> you need to get one of those shipping containers on your front lawn they use for the mobile DCs. Yeah. We're gonna need yeah, shipping I mean, container I, I, to move it too. Yeah. I mean, I could just install it in the garage, but the problem is it it gets hot here, and so I need I need the cool ambient temperature that I get in the basement. Yep. So um. That won't really work. Yeah, send me. I, well, so I'm I'm actually driving my truck. We're going actually we're going out to Wisconsin Dells, so it's not Madison. But it's like you know 45 minutes close, away. Or something. Very close. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, hmm. here, I'll send you the spec sheet. You can you can see if it'll fit. Okay. In okay. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was excited. It looks a cool rack. But... Okay. That page is not found. Oh, wait, no, there we go. Okay. All right. Else? Good deal. For me. Um, I, I just had one quick question. I, I'm just flicking through the um, pull requests. I saw there was a new one for a new cash mode swap. And I've just been sort of flicking through that and quite interested in that because what they seem to have tried to do is that was what I was seeing um, as the main limitation when I was looking at this a couple of years ago in that it's sort of given a multi dimension to the hit set. Um, is that um, that sort of stalled or it, it, I mean, is there anything I can do around that to sort of maybe help get that progressing? Um, I'm trying to have to refresh my memory what this pull request did. I, I remember it being a new mode, but I don't remember. So I mean, what, what you're asking for, um, basically where new objects land in the cache tier um, instead oh, yeah. of being proxied through, is, is, is totally reasonable. And I actually thought that you could tweak the options so it would do that already. Um, but looking at the code, it looks like you can't. So I, I think it's fine to figure out how, what the right, what we want the configuration experience to look like to make that happen, and then we can fiddle with the code. Um, I'm not super excited about like, playing with the cache sharing stuff all that much, um, but this this should have already worked. I think okay. it's fine if we can just figure out what the change is. Um, make it happen. But I'm not, I thought this this swap mode was something else. I have to, I have to read this. So it, it looks like the, where the hits at the moment is sort of like binary, um, it effectively makes it, um, you know, like a bytes worth of information or something so that, because at the moment, is if you've got the hit set, um, say over spanning in an, an hour, um, something that's hit 100 times a second to once an hour effectively looks the same. Yeah. Where that it gives it some more sort of um, dimension to I see. those decisions. That's the temperatures in the bloom set. Yeah. Okay. This is a super nice rack, Sage. Yeah, no. <laughs> it was nimble by. I didn't like uh <laughs> didn't measure it clearly before <laughs> you ordered it. Well it's like it's like a little over thirty inches wide. Is that like the width of your door or something? Yeah, the door is like um twenty nine, thirty, I don't know. I have to go look. It's yeah. Is it trim off the door? <laughs> You should be able to get it in. It's, it's, I mean, it's like concrete on the sides. It's like stairs down, and then I don't think, I mean, maybe if you like remove the door jam. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've got I'll a sawzall I can bring I'll with. I'll take it back to the set performance <laughs> thing. The, yeah. the, the cash tier, it all used to write into the, into, into the cash tier, everything used to go there because it was new objects, and yeah. then someone didn't like that because they were writing data that was just like never gonna be read right. again. And so they, right. and I thought that that was a switch and that it worked with the, with the IO cache hints, but as Nick demonstrated yeah. in the 
source code lines. That's clearly not what's happening. Right. Yeah, that's why I was confused because I thought so, that it was it was the like the min read hits or min write hits or whatever. Um, if you specified like zero, then it would um, or one. I thought there was this like boundary condition where it would flip between that behavior, but um, apparently not. So yeah, I think we should we should fix that. We seem to figure yeah. out. Yeah. Um, why why were you looking at this though, Nick? Um, so I've got a use case where um it's NFS and the writes are coming in basically um in almost like a synchronous fashion. So the sort of the write latency is um important. Um so with file store we were getting the um benefit of everything being double written. Um with Blue Store we're not getting that now. Uh, and I saw sort of one option of using the cache sharing to basically buffer any new incoming writes into the cache tier, and then they get flashed flushed to the slower disks at a later date. But I didn't want that to happen to all writes; it would just be new data coming in. This is kind of related to the blue server issue we were just talking about. I think for why it's it, 10x slower than this sort of fades away. Maybe it's still valuable, also, but that's the Especially important. Yeah, it it sort of comes down to as well the um the sort of deferred right cutoff um because I, I sort of brought this up last week. If anyone had any idea, like if you increase the deferred right threshold above 64k, does that start to have any knock-on impl implications apart from SSD wear? And yeah, I wouldn't expect it to, but. There was like a proposal a year, maybe two years ago, to do tiering inside Blue Store. Mm -hmm. I still like that better than the other tiering. I think the cache tiering. Yeah. If your cluster is sort of planned out ahead of time appropriately, then it's. Um, I think it's it'll work better. <laughs> and if you want it on every poll, which may not be the case. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, the, the reason I ask is I'm I'm skeptical that the cache tiering would actually. I mean, it might make the immediate latency better, but I'm skeptical in the long run it would work well for you, just because yeah. it's improved a lot, but it still doesn't work great for most use cases and. I want people to stop using it. <laughs> I agree, Greg. That's why I brought up the blue stuff yeah. thing. Um, yeah. 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 So, right. So first order of business is figure out why the blue store performance sucks. I think maybe one thing you can do, Nick, though, on the cache string, just fit, maybe experiment with those um, hit set recency settings. I can't remember what they are, but just see if setting them to zero or one changes the behavior. OK. Um, I, can't, I can't quite remember. There are a bunch of, yeah. Yeah, make sure it really is broken. Okay. Cool. Are we done? I think so. <laughs> yep. Unless there's anything else. All right. Yeah. I don't have anything. All right. See you guys. Later on. Thanks, have everyone. A good day. See you next week.